I found a cure for cancer. Pancreatic cancer runs rampant in my family. My father, his father, his father's father were all plagued with the disease. Not to mention the disturbing amount of my extended family members who developed it and died soon after. It has been heart wrenching to watch my loved ones suffer in their last months of life. Two years ago, my brother was diagnosed and died six months later. That one hit close to home. I have always been intelligent. For six years now, I've been working as a medical researcher, specializing in experimental medicine for pancreatic cancer treatment. The death of my brother sent me into a spiral, and I've been drowning myself in my research since. I eat and breathe it at this point. Last year I made a breakthrough. Combination therapy. My first real step forward. A conjunction of monoclonal antibodies, stem cell treatment, potent vitamin infusions, and targeted chemotherapy delivered directly and solely to the cancerous cells. In vitro studies were 100% effective. Finally, last week we analyzed the results from our first preliminary clinical trial. 87% of our participants were in total remission, free of cancer. My heart pounded thinking about the possibilities. With some tweaking this had the potential to be a cure for all types of cancer. We submitted our research paper to a prestigious journal for approval. Not even an hour after the paper was released, I received a call. Hello, Dr. Sanders? My name is Jacob Matthews, I am with the United States Department of Health and Human Services. We were sent your research paper submission. Myself and some of my colleagues are very interested in speaking with you about your research. We would love it if you came into our facility to speak. I was elated. It was the following day, I dressed in my best suit ready to present my findings. Jacob met with me in the front of the building and led me through several doors to the back of the facility. Right in here, he pointed. I entered. The door bolted shut behind me. My heart stopped. The room was filled with my colleagues, members of our research team, all the participants from our study and even their family members. Their bodies stacked atop one another, each with a gunshot wound on the back of their heads. I felt the barrel of Jacob's gun press against my skull. Thank you for bringing your research to our attention. He spoke with an eerie calmness. Unfortunately it will not be getting published. Why? I screamed. Why would you do this? It's simple, really. Cancer is money. I heard him pull the trigger. Every morning, my husband leaves a note on the lunch he packs me for work Monday. My love. I hope the sun shatters your sleepiness and you face the day with eternal optimism. I've filled out some papers I need you to sign on the counter. Just some boring insurance stuff. Car insurance. Your life insurance policy. Nothing to bother yourself with. Just sign at the bottom and I will take care of it. We'll be late at work tonight. I'll be careful not to wake you. Inside. Mediterranean pasta salad, pink lady apple slices, Pocky Tuesday, beautiful wife. I can't believe you found your birthday present I was trying to keep hidden. Lingerie, I know. I'm so cliche. The tags must have gotten ripped off as I was trying to hide them. I know your birthday is five months away, but I was trying to be prepared to make it a great one. It's also why I may have smelt like perfume. I was trying to buy you some at the store. But you'll just have to wait for your birthday to see. Thanks for signing those papers. Inside. Turkey club, cucumber salad, pickled carrots, your favorite. Wednesday. Love of my life. I can't believe the pharmacy said I already grabbed your prescription. I did no such thing. I know how much you need that medicine, so I'll be sure to go down there myself and figure out how they messed this up. I'll even go to the doctor to get you a new one if I have to. I'll do anything to take care of you. Don't you worry my darling. I will be late at work again tonight. Inside. Thai chicken curry, jasmine rice, fresh strawberries, wafer cookies. Sorry if it tastes funny, I've never made curry before. Be sure to eat it all, very healthy for you. Thursday. Dearest love, are you feeling alright? I called your work and they said you didn't even touch your lunch. I only mentioned it because I was talking to your sister. She said you've been acting awfully strange to her. Calling her late at night and asking who she's with. I wish I didn't work so much so I could make sure you're well. Alas, I'll be late again tonight. Inside. Chicken Caesar wrap, grapes, Oreo cookies. Friday. Babe, where are you? I was scared when I came home and you were gone. If you read this I need you to call me, okay? Your sister wasn't picking up her phone so I drove to her house. A lot of police were there. I think something really bad happened to her. I noticed my gun was missing from the closet. Did you move it somewhere? You're worrying me, babe. 
I was actually the last person to see your sister, so I have to go down to the police station to answer some questions. They were pretty adamant about it. I might be a suspect? Please call me. Inside. Bologna sandwich, lays potato chips. The worst part about standing over a dead body is being used to it. What's the story? I asked the forensics expert. We're standing in an open field, miles away from civilization. Police cars, yellow tape, the works. All for some unidentifiable pile of human meat paste. They fell from very high up and went splat. I look around in every direction and see nothing, apart from a pair of tire tracks going to end from the body. Fell from where exactly? This was the fifth time I had to go to a crime scene exactly like this. A body found in the middle of nowhere squashed. Since the body was practically vaporized, we could gather almost no evidence. I knew we were missing some piece of the puzzle, but I couldn't figure out what. Maybe they were skydiving, said the forensics expert. With no parachute? Maybe they were just, you know, killing themselves. Simplest answer is usually correct, right? I guess I need to find out who owns airplanes in the area. Our only lead was a skydiving center 200 miles from the bodies. Unfortunately, they had extensive paperwork for how much fuel they were using, which meant no unregistered flights. So, no dumping bodies, and no skydiving suicide jumps. With little else to go on, the cases went cold. The unfortunate truth is only around 50% of murders are solved. A year goes by, and then five. As a detective, you try to push the unsolved cases to the back of your mind. You try to think about how to keep your wife happy, or make your son's birthday special. This year, I hired a clown for his eighth. Maybe a little old-fashioned, but hopefully he can make TikToks of it, or whatever kids are doing these days. When the clown showed up, he came holding a bunch of multicolored balloons, and gave them out to each of the kids at the party. When he handed one to me, I remembered all those squashed bodies. I wonder. I started making inquiries, asking around about balloons, but expecting very little. I found a small weather station in our jurisdiction. Did you know weather balloons can drift up to 125 miles? I measured out 125 miles from the weather station on a map, drew a circle, and every single body was located inside it. Weather balloons float very high too. How many would it take to lift a human off the ground? By my count, 50. I knew I shouldn't have gone into the weather station alone, but I wanted to be discreet and to solve these murders once and for all. He was so much quicker than I anticipated. The world below is looking small now. It's freezing cold. I finally figured out the missing piece. The tire tracks to end from the body. He had to pick up the popped balloons. Right as I'm about to pass out from the thin air, I hear a cacophony of loud pops. My former best friend has been accused of 12 murders. My ex-best friend and former flatmate, Ryan, has been accused of 12 murders. 12. People I haven't spoken with in 15 years keep messaging me on Facebook to say it's unbelievable, that they had no idea he could do something so gruesome. Or 12 something so gruesomes, even. Never mind the fact his fingerprints were all over that knife. And I keep telling them that, speaking as the person who knew him best, it's not so far-fetched. I guess when the crimes are this despicable you can't blame people for being curious. These sorts of cases really capture the true crime aficionado's attention. My first call, once the story broke, was to Ryan's mom. The poor thing was distraught. In the pauses between hysterical sobs, she kept insisting she was going to hire the best solicitor money could buy and beat the charges. Her son wouldn't mutilate a fly, let alone a corpse. For the longest time, I bit my tongue. I mean, why pile on the grief? But she just kept pushing and pushing, leaving me no choice other than to break the news her son was, odd. Not, this guy's definitely a serial killer, odd, but more, this guy has the potential to become a serial killer, odd. So you really think he did it? She asked, in a weak voice. I sighed and told her about her son's late night walks. The detectives were really interested in those. At the station, I explained how long after dark, I'd sometimes hear Ryan tiptoe down the hall and slip out the front door, quietly. Several of the victim's skulls were found wrapped in newspaper which, coupled with the reconstructive work plastic surgeons were able to do, meant the authorities painted a pretty clear picture of how and when the crime shook out. That meant when I said, yeah, I think I remember the door creaking open that night. And come to think of it, there was a load of fresh dirt on the welcome mat the next morning, they practically ran to press charges. Ryan's mom didn't reply for a long time. 
Then, finally, she said, so you really think he might have killed them? Swallowing a lump, I said, I do. With that, she hung up. I wanted to call her straight back, to tell her I was wrong before, that her son was the friendliest, most caring person I'd ever met. That he was the kind of genuine soul who'd stumble across a discarded knife in our flat's communal car park and go out of his way to dispose of the deadly weapon, so that the neighborhood kids didn't find it and hurt themselves. But I couldn't. Because if I did, and he somehow beat the charges, then the authorities might have started searching for the real killer. And then I'd be in trouble.